our sun wakes up from its snooze with a big solar flare and a partially Earth-directed solar storm that's going to give us a glancing blow. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash SWEN. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Our sun wakes up from an extended snooze over this past week. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, but most of these are really stable. However, we did have region 3403 launch a solar storm to the west of Earth. That was back on the 21st. And then on the 22nd, we had region 3413 launch a solar storm to the east of Earth. Finally, though, we had region 3404 and 3405 get into the fray and they launched some solar storms that are Earth directed. The first was from region 3404. It was kind of a wispy solar storm. Looks like that one's gonna go mainly uh, west of Earth, but it could have a glancing blow component. And then on the 23rd, region 3405, POW fires an M1 class flare. That caused a small radio uh, blackout on Earth's day side, but then also launches a solar storm in two parts. You see that first horseshoe shape, that's the first part. And then the second part is this structure that goes south of Earth. So it makes kind of a convoluted structure as we look at it in coronagraphs, which makes it really hard to model, but it looks like we could get a grazing component from that. So we do have at least one, if not two, but the solar storms, but they're kind of going off to the west of Earth, and that's going to arrive right about the time we get a little bit of fast solar wind from some uh, from a coronal hole that's going to be passing through the Earth strike zone, just barely. So we could get a little bit of a disturbance. It's not going to be all that much. It's likely going to be limited to high latitudes. But hey, finally, it's a wake-up call. Now, switching to our sun's far side, we can no longer rely on stereo A imagery to give us decent images of the sun's far side. So we use uh, JSOC HMI helioseismology as well as SDO, AIA, and HMI imagery from about two weeks ago to give us an idea of what might be lurking on the sun's far side. And as we take a look at, that, at those images, you can see region 3386. That region is actually now rotated uh, off of the, the far side onto the front side of the sun. This is now region 3314. And on the front side of the sun, it is the one that's firing solar storms and is going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone. But region 3386, is, as it used to be known as, is actually a pretty big flare player back one full rotation ago. So we are going to be keeping our eyes on it because we're not quite sure it's all fizzled out yet. Now, on top of that, we are also watching region 3398. This region is going to be rotating uh, back into Earth view here in the next couple days. This region actually started to grow just as it was leaving the west limb, as you can see it there, uh, as it rotated to the sun's far side. And on the far side, as we bring up our helioseismology far side and viewer, you can see region 3398 really started growing in intensity. You can tell by that black spot how dark it is. That shows you that that region is continuing to grow. And as it rotates back into Earth view, it could be either a solar storm player or possibly a big flare player as well. So, you know, we do have some activity on the far side yet that could definitely keep that solar flux boosted and keep uh, solar storms and big flares on the menu. Now, taking a closer look at the solar storms that were launched that were partially Earth directed, we switched to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And as we take a look at the solar storm launch, you can see it there launching basically west of Earth. It looks like a very soft, wispy green crescent. 
and that's mainly because the solar storm is going southwest of Earth, so you don't see a really good impression of it here. But as it reaches Earth, notice that there's a pinwheel that's right behind it. Well, that pinwheel is actually the influence from some fast solar wind that's going to be hitting, and it's almost going to be impacting right Earth right at the same time the solar storm is going to hit. So we could get kind of like a one-two punch from a solar storm and then some fast solar wind, which could enhance things. But this solar storm is wispy at best. We are expecting the impact to be sometime mid to late day on the 27th, but probably only going to give us some aurora or some disturbances up at high latitudes. Not expecting a big aurora show uh, down at mid latitudes from this one. But if you are at high latitudes and you're an aurora photographer, you could definitely get something over maybe the 27th and the 28th. And possibly if we had something from that earlier storm, might see something late on the 26th as well. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the first quarter phase on our way to a full moon, and by the 28th, the moon will be about 90% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch, I don't know, maybe the waning parts of the Perseids or possibly some Aurora, well, you're going to have this bright companion to contend with. So you're going to need to check your local rise and set times. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that solar storm glancing blow along with a fast solar wind chaser, and that should be hitting Earth here over this weekend. Now, we're not expecting a very strong impact from either of these things, but having them hit together could actually enhance us just a little bit and cause a little bit of aurora, especially at high latitudes. In fact, at high latitudes, we're going to be expecting active conditions, but we have up to about a 30% chance of a major storm, and the peak of it should be right around the 27th. But we could get a little bit of storming before that from that earlier solar storm that also looked like it could give us a glancing blow. And then the effects of that fast solar wind are going to linger into the 28th. So right around that 27th, expect that to be the biggest chance for aurora, but you could get chances for aurora from the 26th through the 28th and possibly the 29th before things begin to calm down. So aurora photographers, hey, this could be a decent chance for you. Now at mid latitudes, the story isn't quite so bright. We are expecting only unsettled conditions, even though we are going to be seeing these uh, storms hit. But we do have about a 10% chance of of minor storm conditions, most likely, yeah, if it lasts, it's going to be very sporadic. So aurora photographers, only if you're dedicated should you chase, because really the solar storms that we're expecting and the, the fast solar wind may not be enough to bring that aurora down to mid-latitudes. Switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, but we don't have a lot of big flare activity. And this is actually good news because we also have solar flux staying in the 150s that actually is going to ramp up likely into the 160s before weeks end because of some of the new regions rotating into Earth view. This means amateur radio operators and emergency responders, there's really good dayside flux, which means good radio propagation on Earth's dayside. We also have minor noise on the bands right now because of the lack of flare activity. NOAA is giving us about a 10 to 15% chance of M-class flares. That's at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout, and that's likely going to continue over the next you know, five days or so. We might see an increase as we get to the end of the week. It all depends upon what those new regions look like when they rotate into Earth view. But we do really have no risk for X-class flares at an R3 level radio blackout, so definitely enjoy the great radio propagation on Earth's day side. And GPS users, enjoy decent GPS reception even at dawn and dusk. Switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over this coming week, everything is in the green when it comes to radiation storms. Everything is nice and quiet right now. We're sitting at the D1 normal range for you aviators, and this is at flight level 360, which also is the S0 level for everyone else. And we really don't have any risk for radiation storms at the S1 or S2 level because we just don't have any big flare players on the Earth-facing disk right now. And this is easily going to last out through this week. So you frequent flyers and air crew and pilots, you're all in the clear. 
So the space weather this week is definitely more active than last week. We do have that glancing solar storm blow that's going to be followed by some fast solar wind. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you definitely could get a bit of a show. You could start looking late on the 26th into the 27th and then possibly into the 28th before things begin to calm down. So enjoy that. Now, Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, it's not quite so clear for you. We're not expecting a really strong impact. So only if you're dedicated should you chase and even then make sure you take long exposures with your cameras because sometimes the camera can see things that our eyes just can't. Now amateur radio operators and emergency responders you're loving this week because we still have high solar flux in the triple digits but we don't have those big radio blackouts right now because we don't have a lot of big flare players on the earth's facing disk. So enjoy decent radio propagation with very little noise on the day side bands probably all week before things could possibly change. And now GPS users, well, you're also in luck because we don't have any really strong solar storms happening and we don't have any big radio blackouts. So GPS reception pretty much all over the globe should be top notch. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.